2024, what y'all think? All right, something like that anyways. Welcome to the spring semester. Doesn't feel like spring today, but that's all right. Anybody drip some faucets last night by any chance? Hoping we didn't have any leaks. It's a chilly way to start, more chilly weather coming this weekend, and I wish we had a little snow mixed in, but I don't have any control over that. So, uh, I grew up near Buffalo, New York, and so I miss the snow. At the first chapel of the fall semester, which we call Convocation, I spoke on the value of community in our lives and the value of community in your experience as a student here at North Greenville. And today's message is a second part of a series I'm calling The Four C's. And I think we've got a little slide maybe uh, for that one. And the four C's work like this. In March, we're going to have the second of the series. And then in convocation in August, we'll have um, the, the next one. The idea is that there's four C's we want to expose you to at North Greenville. The first one is community. The second one is calling, which we'll talk about today. The third one is courage, which comes from having a community behind our backs and having a calling that comes from God. And then the fourth one is compassion and the way that we see people around us. Listen to these words from Genesis chapter 3, starting with verse 8. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So the Lord God called out to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he asked, who told you that you were naked? Did you eat from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And the man replied, the woman that you gave to be with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate. So the Lord God asked the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. Second passage that we have this morning is from 1 Samuel chapter 3, very different passage, but also a passage about the voice of God. Samuel 3 begins with these words. The boy Samuel served the Lord in Eli's presence, and in those days the word of the Lord was rare, and prophetic visions were not widespread. One day Eli, whose eyesight was failing, was lying in his usual place. Before the lamp of God had gone out, Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was located. And then the Lord called Samuel, and he said, here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. I didn't call, Eli replied, go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. And once again, the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. I didn't call my son, he replied, go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord because the word of the Lord had not been revealed to him. And once again, for the third time, the Lord said, Samuel, and he got up and went to Eli, and he said, here I am, you called me. And then Eli understood that the Lord was calling the boy, and he told Samuel, go and lie down. And if he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place, and the Lord came, stood there, and called as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel replied, speak, for your servant is listening. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the opportunity to hear your voice, that we are not left out on our own to our own devices, but that you speak to us in ways that sometimes we don't quite understand, sometimes audibly like here in scripture, and sometimes in ways that you move our hearts and you move our minds. And God, you also put us in community where others can listen for us and listen alongside us and can help us to understand your word better and understand your calling better. And so, God, even today in chapel, as we are assembled together at the beginning of a semester, God, we just pray that we will be ones who will listen for your voice, listen intently, and that when we hear it and we understand it, we will obey it. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, calling is one of those topics that a lot of chapel speakers address. In fact, 
when chapel speakers are invited to speak at the university, sometimes they'll call me and they'll say, hey, Gene, what, what do I need to talk about? And I always tell them, please don't talk about calling or God's will for your life or anything like that, because so many speakers do it. And it's an important topic, but often it's handled so frequently and really so poorly that it's a shortcut to a bad chapel experience. And so I speak today with a little bit of trepidation uh, because I'm doing the exact topic that normally I tell people, please don't talk about. As I said, though, calling is the idea that God is preparing us for how we will live our lives according to his terms. We listen for God's voice, whatever that may sound like, and we act obediently when we discern his leading. When I speak at preview days here at North Greenville, I also will, often will quote a friend of mine who once told me that for two generations our culture has been lying to young people by telling them that you can be anything you want to be. You can follow your heart, you can live out your dreams, you can chase your ideas, you can be all that you can be, the army even said. At my kids' high school, for example, there was a huge mural that was painted on the way to the English and history classrooms, and the mural was a garden gate with roses climbing up and around the trellis, but over the gate was a sign that said, follow your heart. And honestly, that mural made me a little upset because that's actually really bad advice, especially from a biblical point of view. Because we know that our hearts are wicked and corrupt, and our hearts without God are things that will delude us instead. In fact, this viewpoint makes you the center of the universe and the ultimate determinant of your path, and that is not a godly point of view. This viewpoint needs to be Christ first, not ego first. The Christian view is that God loves you, God has a plan for your life, and God will reveal his will to you and his calling over your life at the right time, in the right way, in ways that you will understand it, often in community that loves you and will help you to discern that. And this view rightly makes God the center of the universe and his wisdom will guide us. It relieves us from the burden of our own lives and allows us to pursue even greater service to the church and to society. And one of the things that I love and that I've come to understand as I've gotten older is that calling is almost always discerned in community, that it is those who are around us who help us to listen to the voice of God and understand what that means. Often it is the people around us who see things about us that we need to work on or see potential in us that we don't even know that we have, and they are the ones that speak into that sense of calling and allow us to be able to come forward. That's why I like to talk about community. In August, I told you about these guys. I think we got a slide. We got a slide of the Ivy Boys. If not, then I'll go on. There we go. These are the guys from my wedding. This is them in their tuxedos. It's not the Chippendale dancers. They looked good. All of them had hair back then. Most of them don't now. Uh, but we laughed together. We held each other accountable. We worshiped together. We talked until the wee hours of the morning. They told me when I was being stupid or being an absolute jerk. They encouraged me when I had good ideas. They told me when I was dating the wrong girl, several of that. And they cheered me when I got married to the right girl. And they continued to prioritize getting together on the rare occasions when we find ourselves in the same area. Just a year ago, we had a whole pile of us that were able to get together at a friend's house and, and visit. See, calling is discerning community because good community gives us encouragement. It gives us accountability. It gives us enlightenment. It gives us laughter. It gives us joy. I would not be who I am if it were not for those guys and for so many other people who spoke into my life, especially when I was in my 20s and I was at various points where I could have made terrible decisions or I could have been very selfish in what I was doing. You see, calling is the belief that God loves us, God has a plan for our lives, and he reveals it to us at the right time for his purposes and his glory. And I think it's helpful to hear other people talk about their sense of calling. So today I'd like to start by telling you a little bit about my journey to Tigerville. So I have slides. Let's see about the first one. So this is my family. When I was about four years old, we were living in Mississippi where I was born, uh, Dad, Gene Sr., was a Baptist pastor who had incredible hair. Uh, when we moved to New York, he started growing sideburns. It was the hippie time. It was really amazing. Mom's a former beauty queen and singer, and as an adult, became a syndicated radio show host, so we had a, quite the lively uh, household. I had a younger brother, Steve, who ended up working uh, for the Army for over 30 years, served in Afghanistan, and now teaches college business in Texas. Uh, when I was a kid, we left Mississippi for dad to pastor a small church in Buffalo, New York. And it was at that point that I decided that I wanted to become a running back for the Buffalo Bills. 
You can't see it clearly, but I'm wearing cowboy boots, which I guess would disqualify me, although apparently the Dallas Cowboys could maybe do something with that. Uh, any NFL people? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, as a child living in New York, my parents constantly told me, Gene, God loves you. God has a plan for you. You're going to figure it out. When I was about 11, we moved to Virginia, and as teenagers, we were at a church that was a much larger church. There's me and my brother and my, my lovely parents, and the school district that we lived in was one that really held out science as a, a really big deal, and so we had a huge science fair every year, so that's me in about eighth or ninth grade. Uh, I won third place one year. I won honorable mention the other year. My brother is doing kung fu moves there. I'm not sure if you can quite see him. Of course, as a child, he felt like God was calling him to be a monkey, but we <laughs> had to deal with that as a separate issue. Uh, but the bottom line was that my love for science and especially for dinosaurs turned into an outright conv conviction that God was calling me to be an archaeologist or a paleontologist. Yes, Ross on Friends is based on me. Um, maybe not. My high school newspaper even wrote a profile about my plan and how I wanted to make discoveries. So yes, if you can't tell, puka shells were a thing in the 80s. It was amazing. And I chose my college, James Madison University, because of their anthropology and archaeology program. And I joined the Baptist Student Union. We call that Fount here. Uh, and I sang in their version of Joyful Sound. And they actually made a Men of the Baptist Student Union calendar. There's my Baptist beefcake photo. Uh, if you want to read my likes, my dislikes, all that other fun stuff. Uh, and it was at that time that some of my friends, even though I'd had this lifelong passion for uh, science and archaeology and, and ended up getting an undergraduate degree in that, uh, my friends began to talk to me about maybe God is calling you to do something different. Maybe God's calling you to missions. Maybe God's calling you to ministry. Have you really thought about this? Have you really begun to pray about this? It was about that time that a hard romantic breakup uh, had me playing in bands and deciding I wanted to write really depressing songs. It was the 80s, and so think about The Cure and The Smiths. And so to my surprise, I started getting attention as a songwriter. Here's my headshot. There you go. Uh, I won a major national songwriting contest, the Music City Songwriting Contest. Uh, it was amazing. I thought that this was going to be the path for me. I began to dream about being uh, some sort of rock star or something like that. And it was about that time that I met Lisa and everything changed. And all of a sudden I began to feel like I was being called to be a husband. I began to feel like those friends maybe were right and I was being called to do something maybe in ministry. I couldn't quite understand exactly what that was. And so we went to New Orleans and while we were there, my Christian studies professors, as they started to get to know me better, uh, began to say, you know, look, you're already teaching English, you already have a master's in English, have you thought about doing doctoral work in English? And as we began to pray and listen to the voice of these mentors and these advisors, we ended up going uh, to University of Southern Mississippi where I did my doctorate. And then I had a very strange experience. My English professors, that my Christian studies professors had told me I needed to go study under, they all started telling me that they thought I would be a really good administrator and maybe one day a university president. Along the way, Lisa and I became parents. Here's Ethan and Emily as newborns. Uh, Ethan got married on Saturday. It was awesome. There's uh, photos on Facebook, lots and lots of photos on Facebook. By the way, it was in Boca. It was a lot warmer in Boca than here, I have to say. Uh, but I felt called to be a parent. God allowed us and blessed us to be able to be parents. And along the way, we changed jobs, we changed states, we had adventures. And then in 2017, the trustees at North Greenville called me to become the president. And here's the amazing photo from my installation as president, and now I stand here today. Now, I mention these things because I think there are things you can learn from this and things that I certainly have learned from this. Along the way, I had a community of friends and mentors who spoke into my life. My family spoke into my life. My Sunday school teachers and Bible study leaders spoke into my life. My peers spoke into my life. Professors spoke into my life. And God provided me with various experiences, networks, and particular gifts that contributed to my work, my church service, my community engagement, my family life, and my own personal well-being. And this all unfolded in many steps with lots of prayers and tons of conversations with serendipity and surprises. But all of this started with me taking time to listen to God's voice as I felt like he was leading and directing me. 
In the first Samuel passage that I read from 1 Samuel 3, a young man Samuel was asleep and he heard God calling to him. I don't really understand how this works. The passage makes it clear that this was a literal, miraculous voice. In fact, it calls attention to the fact that it was a specific intervention. This was not something that was common and every day at this time. God had not spoken to his people in generations. And so the specific miracle of the moment was there was a voice and Samuel heard it clearly and exactly. He thought it was Eli calling, and he goes to Eli, and Eli tells him, wait a second, bud, this is the voice of God. And in my life, I felt like God has led me specifically on many occasions. The lessons I've learned from these experiences is that God always leads me in accordance with his word. He never reveals to us something that is contrary to what he has taught us in Scripture. In small things, I've sought to be obedient. Sometimes it looks like being obedient when you feel moved to give a large tip to a waitress or a kind word to somebody that's out on the street even, or even to pray for somebody at a specific time. In these moments, the calling is for a moment, and we act in obedience to God in that moment. A few months ago, I was having some extended prayer time and felt very strongly that I needed to pray for a friend that I hadn't spoken to in over a year. I prayed for him, I prayed for his family, I texted him right after that and told him, God just urged me to pray for you, I want you to know I prayed for you, I prayed for your family, I appreciate you so much, I think you're amazing. A few hours later, he texted me and said that I would not believe this, but when I texted him, he and his wife were in the obstetrician's office and had just been told their baby had died. I prayed for them at God's urging in that moment. Because God spoke to me in a way I don't understand. He couldn't believe that I had been praying in that moment. And neither could I. But God leads us and calls us sometimes even in moments. It's not just about the burden of what your job will be. It's about what God is calling us to do in the moment. And we have not just the opportunity to listen to him, but the privilege to listen to him. And to know that his calling may be for a moment in order to encourage and serve others. But then there are large things. There's jobs, there's buying a house, there's moves, there's church decisions, life decisions like marriage. I think the Samuel passage also lets us know that in our uncertainty, we should seek the wise counsel of those who are in our communities. Eli knew Samuel. He knew that he was serious about serving God. He knew the backstory about Samuel's mother and all of her prayers for him. And he knew that what was happening was an important and life-changing thing, even history-making. And I think that this all culminates in this, that God's calling can be revealed to us in a number of different ways. Here's maybe some practical things for you. One, God gives us talents and passions that are innate and highly personal. Maybe it's the love of music or science or other people or competition. These traits become the raw materials that God will shape and direct to prepare us for more specific purposes. I loved music. And I I played guitar, I played bass, I played keyboards, I sang in groups, I did all those things. And God gave me these talents that are part of my family. My mom was a singer, her brother, all of her family were singers and all that. And it was because I loved music that I ended up doing songwriting, which caused me to write lyrics, which caused me to write poetry, which led to a graduate degree in English, which led to a doctorate in poetry, which led me to become an administrator, which led me to become a university president. And it was this very beginning thing that I was passionate about that God had given me a talent in that step by step unfolded into all of these other things. But then, too, I also know that God gives us specific gifts, specific networks, specific experiences that are providentially granted to us uniquely even because they are the ways that God will weave things together to point us in the direction that we're to go. For Christians, we know that God supernaturally gives us spiritual gifts that are for the building of the church and the service of our fellow persons. But God also gives us networks. It's not just that he gives us supernatural gifts. He gives us unique and practical networks of connections that can open doors to us because God is guiding and directing us, along with life experiences that are unique to us and can equip us for his calling. For example... When the board invited me to come in 2017 and to be voted on as president, I'd actually never been to campus except for a quick drive through while we were on vacation in Asheville. Uh, We were living in Florida. I didn't know anyone on the board of trustees, or so I thought. And when they brought me and Lisa into the room to introduce us, one of the board members, a lady named Betty Jo Kraft, who since has uh, passed and gone to her glory at age 99 and 11 months, 
Uh, she stood up immediately in the room and started coming up to the front to give me a hug. The board chair, Bill Tyler, said, Miss Betty Jo, hold on. We haven't even introduced him yet. Give him a minute. And she said, I don't need an introduction to him. That's Gene Fant. The last time I saw him, he was eight years old, standing in his daddy's driveway in New York, where my husband Ira and I were helping to plant their church. I was in Mississippi. We moved to New York. Dad planted churches. The churches were sponsored by South Carolina Baptist. That led to this, 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 this. All of a sudden, I'm in Tigerville, and God has brought a network in that was very specific to the Board of Trustees in Tigerville, and I was sitting next to a lady who had known my parents 50 years previously. I turned to another guy in the room, a guy named Seth Buckley. We introduced ourselves to each other, and we started talking, and I said, I used to know a guy named Sid Buckley. You don't know him by any chance? He said, Sid is my dad. I'd never met Seth before, but my mom and his dad had sung together in singing groups all the way back to their late teens and 20s and had sang in choirs and special music together. I had preached and he had led the music in multiple churches in Mississippi, but Seth and I had never met each other. But here we were, Mississippi, New Orleans, Tigerville, and God weaves these things together. And God is the one that plans these things out. We can't do it. And how humbling is it to know that God himself providentially guides our lives with spiritual gifts, networks, and experiences that he can weave together to allow us to be able to accomplish his purposes for his glory. And the third thing, God gives us community and mentors who love us. There are special people in your life who will change the path of your decisions and interpretations. For me, an important mentor was my Sunday school teacher right after college, David Woolwine, who wasn't afraid to say, Gene, you're a jerk. And that was really helpful to me at that time. And he challenged me not to settle for second best. He said, here are the things that I see in you, and here are the ways that I think God could use those things. And it wasn't just him. It was friends. It was colleagues. It was parents. It was aunts and uncles. It was tons of stuff. And here at North Greenville, we have faculty members, staff leaders, coaches, classmates who can be iron sharpening iron to help you to see things about your life and your calling that you don't yet see and who can give you ideas that you do not yet have and can help you to discern parts of your calling that you have not yet discerned. Additionally, I think it's helpful to know that God's calling works in many directions. One, it's inward and it's personal. It expresses itself in our personal holiness and piety. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 through 7 says, This is God's will, your sanctification, that you keep your way, yourself away from sexual immorality, that each of you knows how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not with lustful passions like the Gentiles who don't know God. For God has not called us to impurity, but to live in holiness. And we can never doubt that God calls us to live in accordance with his word and to and, to, and he challenges us to resist sin. So there is a personal element to this that daily we are called to holiness. We are called to listen to his will. The second thing is that it's often focused on how we can serve others. The joy of my life is connecting people to opportunities. I was on the phone with somebody the other night. They were asking me about a guy that was a finalist for a job. And uh, I said, that guy's great, but let me tell you about another guy whose name just popped into my mind. And the guy said, what are you talking about? And uh, now we're working on trying to, I, I love doing that because it serves others and encourages others. And I think that that's one of the ways that God's calling is lived out in our lives is how we can serve and encourage others. And then the third thing is that it's God honoring. Understand this, God doesn't need you. You need God. And how incredible is it that the God who doesn't need you will not come to you and say, I need you to do this. What he'll say is, I am at work doing this. I love you. Would you come alongside and help to do this? It's incredibly humbling to watch God be able to do that and to use people like me, people like you, to accomplish his glory for his honor and for his purposes. God's calling is lifelong, but our understanding of it may have different seasons. I've come to understand that God sometimes reveals pieces of our calling to us one step at a time, but always at the right time. I can't tell you how many times I've watched doors close or I've watched circumstances change. And, and I thought I wanted to be a running back for the Bills. That was stupid. I thought I wanted to be an archaeologist, a paleontologist. And I went and I studied that and I studied in cultural anthropology, which I did not want to take but I learned how to study cultures and structures and politics 
and all these other things that I use now every day, in fact. And then I switched to English, and I learned particular things there. I studied biblical languages in seminary. I learned things there. I, I studied poetry and 17th century politics in my graduate program. I did a postdoc. I did all these things. And, and to watch God weave all these little things one time at another, one after another, talking to different people, and then to watch him culminate that in the place where I am. And what I also know is that I am not where I will be. Lord willing, if I don't die or drop dead or something on the stage. God continues to do that and will continue to do that for the rest of my natural life. I've come to understand that God reveals pieces of our calling to us and our understanding today may unfold and transition into a new understanding for the future. And I find this incredibly liberating. As an 18-year-old, I didn't have to know what to do with my rest of my life. What I needed to know was what to do that day and to listen to the voice of God. Don't carry the burden of thinking that every decision you make today is what's going to end up having to do for the rest of your life. Be faithful today, and God will weave that into your future. And understand that that is an incredible thing because God's providence never fails us. It's the loving, guiding force that changes our lives. When we have a strong sense of of calling, it will give us courage to live our lives with intentionality as transformational leaders for church and society. We're going to talk about that in March. We also will have a strong sense of calling that leads to a clear expression of compassion as we serve others and we seek to be an overflow of God's love. I'll talk about that in August. But understand this, God's calling is ultimately rooted in his love for you. God does not sit on a mountain waiting for us to discover us. He is the God who seeks. He is the God who calls out. Which goes back to the first passage that I read in Genesis 3. In that passage, Adam and Eve had sinned, first sin in paradise. In their guilt, they had hidden themselves from God. And God walks in the cool of the day, calling out their names, seeking them, calling out to them. He confronts them over their sin. He punishes them, but it's a punishment that is grave yet loving. And in that punishment, we see the seeds of what we now know as the gospel, that God seeks us out while we are yet sinners. Christ had died for us. It's the gospel that says God has provided a remedy for our guilt through Christ. That we have an opportunity even today to listen to his voice calling out and saying, where are you? And we can answer and confess our sins and repent and claim the rescue of Christ that changes everything and places us onto the path of our true calling. I'll also mention in that Samuel passage, did you notice that it said Samuel did not yet know the voice of God? That God had not revealed it. Samuel had not understood God until after this happened. So even those of you who pride yourself, maybe even in this place, that I'm not like one of those people down the front that sing and hold up their hands and stuff like that, God is already speaking to you. And God knows your name. And God loves you and has a plan for you. So are you listening to the voice of God? Is he telling you to make changes in your life? You need to be obedient and do that. Is he offering to forgive you of your sins? You need to accept that. We have staff here. I'd love to talk to you about that after the service if you're wanting to do that. I'll even be up here and I'll talk to you if that's what it needs to be. Is he telling you something about how you're living, something that you need to go strong after? Is he telling you something you need to not go strong after or change? Are you living for his glory or are you living for your own reputation? Is he revealing something about you that you need to know about your major, your dating life, your grad school goals, your big, your small decisions, how you're going to serve? Is he telling you to listen to voices around you that love you and want what's best for you? Is he revealing to you even today that there's a fresh sense of calling in your life? If so, listen to his voice, obey it, and understand that it is a wise and loving force. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the start of a semester that we get clean starts every few months while we're in college. And that in these times, we don't quite have all the deadlines crushing on us. Sometimes we even have cold snaps that require us to stay inside a little bit more. God, I pray that each and every student, every faculty member, staff member, coach, anybody that's in here, I pray that all of us will take moments to stop and pause and reflect and understand that you love us and you are speaking to us and you have a calling on each and every one of our lives. And so, God, today we pray that you will speak and that we will hear and we will respond in obedience. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Y'all have a great week.